Hello and welcome to another Drug Chuck episode and today we'll be talking about antiplatelets like clopidogrel and how they work plus some pharmacology. So let's get right into it. So a quick breakdown of everything in this video. First we'll talk about how platelets actually work. Then we'll talk about the ADP P2Y12 antagonists like clopidogrel and the mechanism of action. Then we'll get into the thionoperidines versus the non-thionoperidines antiplatelets. Then we'll talk about the drugs in detail like the dose and indications. Then the side effects and then a quick summary. And then as always at the end we'll have a short quiz to see what we retained. So a quick overview just so we're all on the same page. Antithrombotics are also known as blood thinners because essentially we're thinning the blood and they're broken down into three sections. So these are the three categories of drugs we could have. We could have antiplatelets like clopidogrel. We could have anticoagulants and thrombolytics. And here we're going to focus on antiplatelets and this category breaks down into several others such as COX-1 inhibitor which is our aspirin our PDE3 inhibitors, our ADP P2Y12 receptor antagonists, and this is clopidogrel and other drugs in that class, which we'll focus on in this video, glycoprotein 2B3A receptor antagonists, and thrombin receptor antagonists. But again, we're going to be focusing on this ADP receptor antagonist section. So to know how these antiplatelets work, specifically clopidogrel and the ADP P2Y12 receptor antagonists, we need to know how platelets work in general. So here we have a calm platelet, and the calm platelet usually just circulates our bloodstream and doesn't really do anything until we get a cut or damage in our vascular tissue, and that calm platelet senses the damage and becomes a mad, angry platelet. Now at this point, we have platelet recruitment and aggregation, which just means more and more platelets are coming together. And the cell mediator or the signal for the cells to recruit and aggregate is thromboxin A2 and ADP. Now, if you remember, we're talking about clopidogrel in this video, and clopidogrel is an ADP receptor antagonist, just to keep that in mind. Once these platelets are recruited together, they form a platelet plug. Now, while this is happening, we also have something called the coagulation cascade, which essentially forms something called fibrin, which is basically a fiber. And the fibrin actually binds the platelets together to form a more consolidated fibrin clot. So this is an even stronger blood clot than just the platelets alone. And this is how platelets work. They bind together, and specifically thromboxin A2 and ADP cause this binding together of the platelet plug. So if a patient has a risk of forming blood clots, one of the things we could do is reduce that ADP molecule from binding on the receptor. So that way we prevent blood clots from occurring and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail on how that actually works. All right, so let's take a look at the ADP receptor because we just said that the ADP molecule causes more and more platelets to recruit and aggregate to become a platelet plug. Some of this may look confusing, but I promise you it's not. Right now, we're looking at the surface of a platelet. And here we have that P2Y ADP receptor, and our drugs are going to block this receptor. And if we block this receptor, we allow this enzyme called adenyl cyclase to work. And because we're allowing it to work, it makes ATP break down into cyclic AMP. And the cyclic AMP causes an increase in pKa. Now, when you have an increase in pKa, it controls the platelets and it causes a decrease in platelet aggregation. So long story short, what to take from this is that when ADP is blocked, 
we have less platelets. Now that we know blocking the ADP receptor stops the platelets from recruiting and aggregating, what's the point of actually blocking platelets? Well, if we have overactivation of these platelets, they could produce something called a thrombus. And a thrombus is basically an unwanted blood clot. And these unwanted blood clots can cause serious damage and even death in a lot of patients. If this thrombus breaks off and floats in the blood, it's called an embolus. And this embolus can reach our brain and cause a stroke because it's stopping the blood supply to the brain. Now, if that embolus goes to the heart, it can block the coronary blood vessels and cause a heart attack because your heart's not going to get blood. Or if it goes through the heart, it could get to the lungs. And when it's in the lungs, we call that a pulmonary embolism. And this is one of the most severe and life-threatening blood clots that a patient could get because there's a high percentage of sudden death when you have a blood clot traveling to the lungs. So as you can see, it's a very serious and dangerous disease state, and we need to have patients on antiplatelets to prevent any of these complications. Now, not every patient has to be on antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapy, but if our patient has had a stroke or a heart attack in the past, there's a good chance that they may have another one in the future, and that's when we use these drugs to prevent a secondary occurrence. Or if the patient is at high risk, because let's say they're going through chemotherapy, if they have cancer, we put patients on these drugs to prevent a blood clot from forming. So when using antiplatelet therapy, specifically the ADP receptor antagonists, we can break them down into two separate groups. We have something called the thionopyridines and the non-thionopyridines. So starting on the left-hand side, we have the thionopyridines. And thiano just means that there's a sulfur in the rings, and it's a pyridine group. And the reason why I bring this up is because if we have a sulfur, we usually think about allergic rashes that happen in patients. Also, if you could remember the thionopyridine drugs, that sulfur group has a covalent bond, which basically means it's a very strong bond and it's an irreversible inhibitor. Now the three drugs on this list is going to be ticlopidine, which is ticlid, clopidogrel, which is Plavix, and prasugrel, which is effiant. But we'll get into the detail of these drugs on the next slide. On the right side, we have the non-thionopyridines, which suggests that there is no sulfur group, and it's a nucleoside analog, meaning it's a natural nucleoside that we have in our body. And because of this, we have a reversible bond, which means we have a faster onset of action. And the two drugs here, we have Ticagrelor, which is Berlinta, or Cangrelor, or Cangreal. Now keep in mind, both of these subsets of drugs do the same exact thing. They block the ADP receptor, causing a decrease in platelet activation. All right, so let's get into the drugs. So first we'll talk about the thionopyridines. Remember, there's a sulfur group, that's why there's the word thiano, and because of that, they're irreversible, and they could also cause allergic rashes. Now the first drug on the market was ticlopidine, which is ticlid. Now typically, we will not see this on the market if you're in the United States. They may still use this outside of the country. And the dose used to be 250 milligrams, by mouth twice a day with food. Again, this was the first drug to market. It could cause that rash, and it's not popular anymore because of the other drugs that we'll get into. Now, the drug that kind of took over was clopidogrel or Plavix. Here, we see the dose to be 75 milligrams by mouth daily. Keep in mind, there could be a loading dose of 300 milligrams, but it's not always constituted. So more information, we know it's the most popular, but very, very important high yield information is that the patient must have CYP2C19 activity because this drug is a prodrug and it will not get activated 
if they don't have CYP2C19. You also have to watch out for drug-drug interactions. So any drugs that inhibit or induce CYP2C19 will have a contraindication with clopidogrel. So very high yield information. Clopidogrel, you must watch out for the CYP2C19 enzymes in the liver so that it could activate the drug. So when do we use these antiplatelet medications? Well, we've talked about this before. If they've had a heart attack or stroke, or they're at a high risk of developing a heart attack or stroke, they could be on this medication. Or if a patient has peripheral artery disease, which is basically instead of a blood clot blocking the blood flow, it's fat and lipids that build up over time in the veins that stop blood flow. So they could also benefit from this antiplatelet therapy. Now the last thionopyridine antiplatelet drug is Prasugrel, which is brand name Effiant. And here we have a loading dose of 60 milligrams by mouth, and then a 10 milligram daily dose for maintenance. Some important information for Prasugrel is that it's the most potent, and you have to be very cautious in patients that weigh less than 60 kilograms. And you only use this medication with patients that have something called a percutaneous coronary intervention. It's a long fancy word for having a stent. And a stent is just that metal brace that opens up the blood vessel so that blood can flow through. So Prasugel is only in patients with stents. And those are our three thionopyridine antiplatelet drugs. Now let's talk about the non-thionopyridines. And here we only have two drugs. So first let's start with Tocagrelor, which is brand name Brilinta. And here the dosing starts with an 180 milligrams as a loading dose. And then we drop it down to a 90 milligram dose twice a day for a year. And then we drop it down to 60 milligrams by mouth twice a day. So some information, a very important fact to know, is that you do not exceed aspirin 100 milligrams a day because then it antagonizes the effect of ticagrelor. You can't use both of them if you're using aspirin more than 100 milligrams a day. And you can use with or without stents. So remember, before we talked about prasugrel being with stents, ticagrelor can also be used with stents. Now some unique side effects for ticagrelor is that you could see ventricular pause in patients where their ventriculars contract and stay contracted for more than three seconds. We may see gynecomastia, which is breast development in men, or dyspnea, which is just a term for shortness of breath. And now our final ADP receptor antagonist drug is Cangrelor, or brand name Cangrel. And here, this is IV only. So the dosing is 30 micrograms per kilogram, IV bolus immediately, and then you follow it with a continuous infusion at 4 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Now, Cangrelor is only used during surgery, and the onset's 2 minutes. So it's the fastest onset out of all of these antiplatelet drugs. So now let's go over some of the common side effects that we might see when we use ADP receptor antagonists or any antiplatelets. And the first thing we might see is bleeding. And that makes sense because we're stopping the natural clotting of blood by stopping the platelet activation. And if we do this too much, we might see anything from a common nosebleed all the way up to a blood hemorrhage in our brain. The next thing we might see is bruising. Because we're not allowing our blood to clot or fix itself if there's an internal damage, that might cause easy bruising or an internal bleed. And the last thing we may see is dyspepsia, which is just basically your stomach not handling the drug too well and you have some discomfort. So these side effects can range anywhere from being very serious to very minor. All right, let's have a quick recap of everything we learned. So here we have our calm platelets, and we know these calm platelets circulate our blood. And then once we have a finger cut or some sort of damage, they sense it and they become activated as mad platelets. These mad platelets then react to 
thromboxin A2 and ADP. And once it senses the thromboxin A2 and ADP, it causes them to aggregate even more, making a platelet plug. But we now know that we have ADP receptor antagonists like clopidogrel that block ADP. So when we block the ADP receptor, we let adenylyl cyclase do its thing and it breaks down ATP to cyclic AMP, which increases the PKA concentration, which then controls and decreases the platelets. So then we talked about the five drugs in this class. We started with the thionopyridines, which have that sulfur group that makes them irreversible and can also cause a rash. The first one we talked about was ticlodipine, brand name Ticlid, and this isn't on the market anymore. Then we talked about clopidogrel or Plavix, which kind of took over, but it's a prodrug and requires CYP2C19 for it to activate. And we also talked about prasugrel or effiant. Then we went into the non-thionopyridines or the nucleoside analogs. And here we only had two drugs. And we talked about ticagrelor, which is brand name Berlinta, and cangrelor or cangreal, which is only used in surgery. And that's everything. So let's get into the short quiz to see what we retain. So question one, which of the following is true for the ADP P2Y receptor antagonists. Question two, which of the following is a non-thionopyridine ADP P2Y receptor antagonist? Question three, what is the maximum amount of aspirin a patient can take while on Berlinta? Question four, which ADP P2Y antagonist is used as an IV route during surgeries?